Welcome back. Jay Skursky in studio from the Buffalo News. And, uh, you know, Jay, you're covering this team. They had uh, a cardiac victory uh, against the Vikings. And, you know, I did the Fred Jackson show last night. We talked about the fact that really for 59 minutes, uh, the Bills played horribly. I mean, turnovers, mistakes, even on that last drive, <laughs> and, and a questionable call maybe, but intentional grounding, they get yeah. set back. 10 seconds off the clock, and yet they still overcame all that. So there's something to be said for a win is a win is a win. Yeah, I mean, especially when you consider how many times they've l figured out ways to lose games like right. that. I mean, Kyle Orton now in three starts has led two fourth-quarter comebacks, and, and that's there's definitely something to be said for that. You know, to go 80 yards in, in three minutes and to convert a fourth and 20, how many times have we ever seen something like that converted? Right. So there are some positives to take away from it, that they're finding a way to win games that they should win. I mean, a, a loss to Minnesota at home, and I think you start to really kind of consider where's, the, where's this season going. Now you, you at least push that conversation off maybe a week or two by, by winning a game that, as I said, you should win. To me, and I want your opinion, everything starts with the problems they're having on the offensive line. I agree. I mean, and it's, it's time, I think, for them to start making some moves there. I mean, they've got a guy in Craig Urbeck sitting on the bench who started, you know, the last two years, I think, every game. So he can play in this league. Has he been great? No. Has he been a pro bowler? No. And clearly Doug Marone sees something that he doesn't like in, in Craig Urbeck. That's why he's not in the lineup. But if you watch uh, Cyril Richardson against the Minnesota Vikings, you, you would have to come to the conclusion that he's just not ready to play in the NFL. And he's only a rookie, and I think, I think the right move is to sit him down. Maybe it's only for a couple of weeks. If Urbic struggles, then you can always come back to Richardson. But I think they've got to do something to try and spark this offense, and, and, and in particular this offensive line. And bringing in a, a veteran guy like Urbic, I think, is the, the easiest, safest, best place to start. Well, what are you hearing about Chris Williams? I mean, how, when is he going to be healthy again? Injured reserve. So he, he's out for the year. Uh, that's not an option. You know, th they didn't go with the short-term injured reserve for him. They went with the, the long-term. He's out they for the season. They put him on injured in reserve? Yeah, before, uh, yes, two weeks ago. So well, it must have been on vacation. <laughs> uh, but, well, the, the issue with Urbic, and it also goes to Mike Williams, and that is, and I have no problem with the coach deciding for whatever reason, this guy's not my guy. He can't play. Yeah. But I think the, the fans deserve and the media deserve some kind of explanation because Urbic, you're right, he was a starter. They're, su they're suffering terribly on the offensive line. He will not put him in the lineup. Williams, he came up with the three tight end excuse against the Patriots. You know, last week he was running scout, but he was active for the game. I mean, uh, to explain it away with the excuse he used with the three tight ends, obviously there's something else going on there. I think so, and, and the fact that Mike Williams doesn't play special teams hurts him. I think had Marquise Goodwin not been hurt, he would have been inactive for a second straight week. So I, it, it may just be at this point that they like Chris Williams better as a wide receiver than Mike Williams, and, and Hogan, uh, I said Chris Williams, excuse me, Chris Hogan, they may like him better than Mike Williams at receiver, and, you know, Hogan made some plays in this game. We can't take that away from him, but I feel like that's an indictment of the coaching staff in the sense that Mike Williams has proven that he can play in this league. He's had some big years in Tampa Bay, and he's a talented offensive player on an offense that is struggling. So that's on co the coaching staff. That's on Nate, Mar uh, Nate Hackett and Doug Marone to figure out a way to best utilize him. I mean, plenty of teams in the NFL use four wide receivers. Goodwin has not really factored into the receiving game too much. So you can go with Hogan and you can go with Williams and Robert Woods and Sammy Watkins and, and figure out a way if you're struggling to run the ball and now maybe even that's going to be more of a challenge without C.J. and Fred for, for an amount of time. Figure out a way to go with four wide receivers and get Mike Williams involved, get him out on the field, utilize those talents. That's something that I would like to see this coaching staff do. And it, and it, it goes back to the, even the issue with, uh, with Spiller. And, and the way that they were utilizing him. At some point, when, when a player is as proven as Mike Williams or C.J. Spiller is in the NFL, it, it's clear that they can get it done. They can do it in this league. I think then it goes to Nate Hackett to figure out a way to utilize those talents. You know, Nate Hackett has been getting killed uh, the last couple of weeks uh, on the talk shows and, and uh, you know, on Twitter and everything else. And certainly there's a lot of responsibility is on his shoulders, although I think Doug Marone is ultimately <coughs> controlling how that offense is looking. And when they, the talk they talked is not the walk they're walking. When they came to town, we were going to run a no huddle. You know, there were stories about Hackett sitting there with Jim Kelly doing film study on the old Bills, uh, you know, a no huddle offense. Yeah. They wanted to run it fast. Okay, they get a rookie quarterback. That turned out not to be the plan. 
But they are so conservative right now. I mean, at, at times I think Vince Lombardi's running this <laughs> offense. They want to just run and run and run the ball and then throw when they have to. I mean, that appears to be their plan right now. Yeah, and Doug Marone said it last week that, you know, the, the perfect offense, he may not have used the word perfect, but it, the ideal offense in his mind is a 50-50 run-pass balance. And we're away from that in today's NFL. This is a passing league. 60 or 70% of the time teams are throwing the ball. And that's where the Bills, I think, are going to be forced to go now right. because of the issues on the offensive line and the issues at running back. So they better figure out a way to do it. And I'm glad you brought up the conservative nature because there have been several times, even in, in this Minnesota game, a game that they won, fourth and one at, the 41, at their own 41-yard line coming out of halftime, and they punt. And, boy, I mean, for an offense that's just struggling to get any rhythm, any kind of momentum, you would like to see them say, okay, let's pick up a yard here, you know, and, and it's just a, that's Marone's conservative nature. Twice this year he's declined penalties that would have set up fourth or two, fourth or three situations in positive territory to punt. So yeah. it's, it's just uh, it's very interesting how conservative he really is, and it's, uh, to me I would like to see him be a little bit more aggressive, absolutely. Uh, you know, back to the issues of the players and who's playing and who's not playing, I think the sense is that maybe if there is a rift between him and Doug Whaley, that's where it starts. That Whaley has brought in some players like Mike Williams, who he thought could contribute, and he's, you know, he was deactivated for the biggest game of the year. Uh, those kind of things, I'm sure, have to rub Whaley the wrong way. Yeah, and Bryce Brown, too, who now we're going to see, you know, has been inactive for the first seven games of, of the season. So, you know, they, he, he, I think Doug Whaley could, con, could make a good argument that he's given this, this team pieces. And, you know, the offensive line, they did try to sign Chris Williams. That didn't work out. He was hurt. So maybe there's areas there. But it, if, you, if you look at the, the, the problem along the offensive line and you were to watch even one training camp practice, you would realize that Doug Marone spends the – vast majority of his hands-on coaching time with that line. So I know that's got to be eating him up, that they're struggling as much as they are along the line, because that's his specialty. He's an offensive lineman at heart, and you're right. Doug Whaley's given him some skill pieces in Brown and in Mike Williams that they haven't been able to best utilize, and now when you see the offense struggling and you've got guys who were brought in by the front office, like Craig Urbeck, not getting a chance because the coaching staff doesn't like him for some reason. I, I would see Doug Whaley questioning that for sure. You know, two years ago they had uh, Joe DeSella, DeSella, um, De Alessandris. De Alessandris. I think I got that wrong. <laughs> uh, but he was a great offensive line coach. There, Actually, yeah. I emceed a dinner uh, at DePaulo's where they honored the offensive line because they had they'd given up the fewest sacks in the NFL and they had a great running game. Three of those linemen are still on this on this unit one's not playing Urbic was one of them um, I know he was recently in town and you know he kind of said I'd take any one of these guys uh, you're right Marone has come in as an offensive lineman that was his background and this has been the biggest area of weakness and, yeah, and, and D. Alessandris, you're right, has gone out to San Diego and done a really nice right. job. They brought in Chad Reinhardt, who played here under, uh, under him and uh, under the former regime. Wasn't a star by any means, but when they let Andy Levitri go, I think a lot of this dates back to that decision. And, yes, I thought the Titans overpaid Andy Levitri. But I think that Doug Marone uh, thought that he could just about put anybody in at left guard and get them functional, and they've been chasing it ever since, right. you know, going back to Colin Brown last year even. They haven't been able to, to fill that position, and it's been a big problem. And then on top of that, they wanted to replace Eric Pierce, so they kicked him inside, and now you've got three new starters when maybe you would have only had two had you left Pierce at right tackle. It's a mess. Hey, we're going to take a break. We're going to come back more with Jay Skursky from the Buffalo News right after this.